What is up acting fans, Simon here. Welcome to Hannah Talk. Hope you're all doing fantastic. Today I'm here with a very special guest. He is an acting extraordinaire who's best known to fans in various cartoons such as Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, as well as Kung Fu Panda, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but he's also played the genie in various Disney productions as well as being part of the Disney and Marvel Universe and so much more. Please welcome Jim Meskimen. G'day, g'day. How are you, Jim? I'm going well, I'm going well. I'm uh, actually taking a little... I mean, we're all taking time off in a way, but I'm. We, we, my wife and I decided to actually venture out for the first time in months, and we are at uh, kind of a family vacation home down in, uh, down in Southern California that we haven't been to in months and months. And we actually would put our, our feet in the ocean just a little while ago. Fantastic. Which actually, yeah. yes, that's definitely true. That's fantastic. And obviously during this difficult time with what's happening with the pandemic, how have you been keeping things up, especially on the on the acting side of things? Well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's factually almost impossible to keep uh, running a, a business like a, in entertainment right now. Uh, on camera anyway, but what I've been doing is uh, creating a lot on my own, which a lot of artists are doing. I've, I've got a YouTube channel with a lot of videos on it. I continue to pump content out. I've been doing tons of podcasts like this. There's all kinds of people wanting to talk and discuss things and uh, uh, writing and, uh, you know, kind of organizing and uh, preparing to deliver, basically, because we all were thrust into uh, this very uncertain emergency, and uh, but it's beginning to look like, you know, obviously life can't go on forever like that. Either we're going to just all, you know, dry up like worms in the heat, or we're going to get busy and, and start having lives again. And so we want to be ready and organized so that when someone says, "Hey, by the way, you know, we were shooting that television show and you had a part in it. Are you still available?" And we'll say, "Yes, I am." <laughs> Fantastic. Now, obviously, leading. Now, let's get started with the beginning of your career. How did you get started in uh, in acting? Well, I you know I had kind of a fitful, not fitful, but uh, uneven uh, approach to the, that particular uh, uh, <laughs> landing strip. You know, I uh, my mother was a very and was a very popular actress. She was on Happy Days. She played Richie's mom. Her name is Marion Ross, and so I saw you know and witnessed uh, her rise from being just a workaday actress who you know would support her family as a single mom uh on a couple of commercials a year or maybe uh some television guest stars and which is a struggle you know I, I, i'm amazed that she did as well as she did and then she became slowly became an iconic uh figure through a hit show and uh so i i i really didn't understand there were many things that i understood well about acting uh but i also didn't credit that, um, you know, sometimes lightning doesn't strike, you know, uh, sometimes you don't get the big hit show. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to kind of learn that, you know, the hard way that all, all actors do, that um, there's a difference between being a uh, attached to a, a, a crazy hit show in a day when there are only three networks uh, and being a workaday actor that makes his living in whatever way he can. And that's, that's kind of the way I've approached it. So I'm a, when I got started, I got started in the easiest way for me, which was to distinguish myself as a voice actor, because uh, even though I'd done plays and stuff in college and had some experience as a, uh, you know, what I'll call a physical actor, uh, I mostly had goofed around and, and gained some proficiency uh, and expressiveness with my voice. So I found that, that that gave me just a tiny little bit of an edge over the other 10,000 actors in New York City that were all competing for the same jobs. So that's what, that's really what I started. I started doing promos and commercials and a little bit of animation and uh, sort of build it from there. Fantastic. Fantastic. And who, who and who would you uh, consider like uh, to be your biggest uh, your biggest influences? Uh, well, the people that helped me a lot. I mean, my mother was a huge influence because at least I got to see. You know, I didn't know, I, I didn't figure out, well, how do you get on a hit show? But I did figure out from watching her, how does an actor uh, learn their lines? How does an actor uh, organize?
organize their day so that they can go on auditions? Uh, how does an actor stay in touch with producers and writers so that they can hopefully work with them again uh, and, and stuff like that? So my mom's a huge influence. Uh, there was a voice actor that I, I loved very much who I met uh, in my work as an illustrator for Thundercats. I designed cartoon characters for the original Thundercats series. And that actor's name was Bob McFadden. He played numerous characters on uh, Thundercats and uh, all the other Rankin Bass series and, and specials. And he, he was a real, he and I had a lot in common, uh, just in terms of our interest in, and uh, flexibility. And I sort of modeled myself to the degree that I could on him. And I, he, he mentored me a little bit. And was a really really sweet guy. He's he's gone now, but what a what a talent! And he was he showed me how you could combine voices, and how he would come up with characters by taking two celebrities and putting them together and <laughs> come up with this strange hybrid. And I've done a lot of that stuff, and it's, it's super fun. Fantastic. Now now as mentioned about before, that of course uh, you are uh, apart from being an actor, you're also an impression impressionist as well. Because I've watched right. I've watched uh, various videos on your YouTube channel. We you slip into like these celebrity roles. My question to you is, is that what is the process that you go through with coming up with a voice for like a character that you're voicing for the first time, whether it's like in an animated series or an animated movie versus like impersonating like a celebrity or like a, a character that already like exists in the case of uh, like Genie or Mickey Mouse, for example? Well, yeah, I... Uh... I've done the Blue Genie quite a lot. I haven't done, I, you know, whenever I had I'm tasked with trying to duplicate a, a, a voice that has already been established by by another actor or a celebrity, um, I the process is basically familiarizing myself with it as much as I possibly can. Uh, in and it's often you don't have a lot of time to do that, right? Mm. Um, but I, I familiarize myself. Luckily, we have this great to, tool called the Internet and YouTube, and I, I am on it all day long <laughs> listening to things and uh, looking at clips of actors and seeing how they hold their body and how they hold their jaw and, you know, what, what kind of nose do they have because all these things sort of add up to uh, their signature sound. And, um, you know, it's just a study. It's just a study problem. Like you, if you were... A painter, like I've, I've also been a painter, and you're painting a still life. It's the same process. You you look at it and you observe it and you try something, and then you compare the two and you go, nah, I made mine. That's too blue, and you go back and you go, all right, I'll put a little yellow in it. All right, all right that's, that's getting there. That's getting there. And <laughs> and you never, just like an oil painting, you never actually get there, but you get close enough to people go, oh, that's amazing. You know, that's why wow, that looks just like a photograph. You know. Or if it's a voice, like, oh, it sounds just like Robert De Niro. You sound incredible. It's, it's, I don't know how you do it. That's it's really, that's weird. It's an illusion. I don't like it. It makes me nervous. But anyway. That's fantastic. And it's definitely true how you mentioned about it. Like, uh, you compare it to almost like an oil painting in a way. Because when I watched across your various um, videos of you doing these impressions of these big celebrities... If I, I honestly had to close my, when I closed my eyes and listened to that, I honestly felt like I was hearing the actual actor for the, for the actual actor for a sec. Like your Robert De Niro, your Robin Williams, Ron Howard, all those, all those impressions were absolutely spot on. They were absolutely oh, fantastic. You. And well, and if, you know, people, people ask me, they say, are there, are there any voices you can't do? And I say, yeah, most of them. <laughs> I do the ones that I do very well, and those are the ones I specialize in, you know, because uh, there's 8 billion people on this planet. There's a lot of voices out there. There definitely is. And going on to the, um, like, do you, when when you're working on, like, an animated project or, like, a film or a series, do you walk into a series or a project expecting to play a certain role, or is it just, like, a jack-in-the-box? You just don't know what's going to pop out? Well, generally, uh, speaking on a series, you have uh, auditioned and you've been called back and you know what you're going to do. Uh, but that being said, if you're on a series and sometimes there's a little part that comes in or a little extra thing, uh, they'll either throw you that part and say, hey, can you do a cowboy or hey, can you do this Scottish guy? And go, yeah, yeah, sure. 
uh, or they audition everybody really quickly. When I was working on Thundercats Roar, which is the latest Thundercats reboot and very, a very silly one, uh, they would do that. They would say, "Hey, uh, you know, we're going to audition for this role," and uh, out of out of the main cast. So uh, generally, you come quite prepared. But uh, I had a great experience with a, sh a series called Mad, which uh, the great Kevin Shinnick wrote and created, which was based on, on Mad Magazine, but was hilariously funny satires of uh, popular culture. Uh, and I did that a few years ago, and I would, I would go into the studio, and I literally had no idea what I was going to do. And <laughs> it was delightful, because uh, Kevin knew me well enough and knew what I could do, and... and uh, he said, I just, I, you know, I had a feeling, I, I want your Ian McKellen here, and I need your, and by the way, do you do this voice from this 70s TV show? And I go, I, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> you know? So, and that was a, that was a real treat. I mean, it's nice to have stuff sprung on you sometimes. I, I do enjoy the, uh, the thrill of the hunt and the element of surprise. Uh, that's almost more fun than, you know, if people will trust you enough uh, to do, to offer that to you, that it's, it's pretty delightful. Absolutely, that's fantastic. And across your entire, like, uh, with with your voice acting career, have you ever turned down a role for any particular reason? Yes. Um, these days, uh, of course, the animation world is a lot different than when I was growing up, or perhaps when you were growing up. And, and you know, sometimes you get a hold of scripts that are just like, oh my God, this is just, this is just upsetting, you know? Mm. <laughs> this, is, this is not entertainment. This is just gross or insulting or snarky to the extreme or uh, or mean spirited and stuff like that. I I, I just uh, I'm not interested. You know, I, I, there's too much wretchedness in the world to add to it, mm. and um, I don't want to be a servant to that. Like, you know, the worst thing in the world would be to like you, know, you go ah, what the heck? I'll do it for the money, and they go, they love it. They want you to do it every week. You're like, oh god. That would be a, a tyranny. Mm. That that's definitely definitely true about that because I've experienced that. That's definitely the same across with a lot of actors that I've spoke about that because I I remember I did an interview with um, Doug Stone who did the uh, the mask and I think it was um, Metal Gear Solid and I and he said that his he actually got asked to play in uh, um, he 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 got this uh, audition for this uh, hentai anime which is like this very kind of weird style of anime at the point he said no i'm not doing that so he so of course he says you know i've i've got i've got a i've got a moral code i have to stick to that and i said i've yeah. noticed that across with a lot of with a lot of voice actors for that matter i mean even though that is a particular style in anime that is known at that time but some actors choose like no nope, not doing that so yeah. it's yeah. it's I, I think that's good yeah some people you know it, it, it varies i mean obviously i have a lot of leeway because I, I i make a good living i don't i'm not struggling uh when you're just starting out perhaps you'll do anything but just like you know you've heard about some <laughs> i'm sure you have there's been some actors that well i you know i don't like to talk about it but i started in porn you're like oh okay <laughs> i guess that's a route <laughs> but uh but it's certainly not one that anybody's proud of and at the end of the day you kind of have to go all right what am I really about? What am I? What effect am I trying to create on other people? And I'm very clear about that. I, what, which is why I do quite a bit of stuff on my own because if I'm not working and nobody's hiring me to make people laugh, I still have the ability to make people laugh or to think or to feel better. And it's kind of silly if I don't do it. Not with today's technology. Fantastic. That's definitely definitely true. Now, for any long running series or any series where you're playing a character that's featured prominently across the series, do you have an idea for the story arc you're working in, like where your character's going or in the overall story, or are the scenes you work on recorded out of context? That's a good question. I The series is that I've worked on, the series I've, I've worked on, have not had this long arc. So I've not really noticed that. Like even, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Legends of Korra and um, uh, Avatar, the and I, I was not, I didn't have a very large part in those series, so I was not privy to the whole big, you know, the big arc of it. I just didn't, was unaware of it, and it didn't really matter for my performance um, to anybody. So, uh, but I, I, I can see that that would, on a, on a, if you were like 
number one or number two on the call sheet and you were like the star of the show, you'd want to know kind of the, the general direction that it was going in for sure. I, I think that would help to inform your performance. I just, it's not been my kind of, my kind of assignment so far. Right. But if you're but if you're working across on like a film, for example, like an animated feature where your character is featured prominently across that, in the case of uh, Constantine, City of Demons, yeah. for example, do you have an idea yeah. for the general story of like where that like where that story is going? Yeah, I had the whole for that. That's a feature. I had that whole script, and on the features that I've worked on, you, 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 although they're very protective of them, <laughs> you, you can get the whole script and see what the heck you're fitting into. And, uh, and Constantine, yeah, I definitely knew where that was fitting with the whole thing. And so that helps you to locate and figure out the pacing. It, you know, it, it, I think it's different in a, in a movie. Uh, I've been in movies where you're shooting out of sequence, and uh, that can be kind of confusing. Uh, you know, do I know this now? Uh, is this, has she left me already? And we're at this before, you know, or we made up already? You know, you have to kind of sort through that. And, uh, and to make the illusion of, of time uh, be convincing. But uh, I, I'm sure if you, I'm, I'm sure some of the other uh, voiceover actors you've talked to have been more in a situation where they, they have to kind of know the arc of the story, they have to know where things are going, they have to know, is my character actually going to turn around and betray everybody at the end of this thing? Because you know? that would certainly have a lot to do with it. Well, well that's interesting yeah. about how you mentioned that, because, I mean, last interview that I spoke with was... Um, at least one interview that comes to mind for me where with a series that was has quite a bit of longevity to it was in fact with Spike Spencer when he did a uh, um, Neon Genesis Evangelion and I asked him like whether he had an idea for where the series was going when he went into recording the episodes he said no nah, typically they were recorded out of context but I sort of had an idea for where the last two episodes were going to go and he explained to me his reaction was like what just happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. especially yeah. if you're playing in a series that's like a very big deconstruction of the robot fighting animation and is basically a very intense character study it's like yeah we've seen all these people like blow up and go through all these traumatic experiences and then suddenly at the end of the last two episodes they're applauding the main character saying congratulations it's like yeah. what just happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's really, a, I think animation is really a, you know, although the voice actors have so much to do with it and designers and everything, it's kind of a writer's game, you know, kind of a writer-creator game, and they, they get the big picture, you know, especially in the video game world where it's, you know, absolutely Im impossible to grasp the scope of it unless you're you're part of the production team or, or, or the, you know, the initiator, the, the creator of it. I mean, you just, it's just too much to embrace. Uh, an actor coming in and doing one or two characters that may take place in some part of that game if the player goes to a place and manage, you know, taps you on the shoulder if that <laughs> happens. There's just so many maybes involved in the whole thing. It's just very, I, I think it would be very daunting. And so I think it's the only people that really have a good grip on that stuff are, are those ones at the top. Right. That's that's definitely true. But now, going across... Now, Going across to like when with the voiceover world, what was like your first voiceover role? Uh, in a series, it was uh, a, a series for Rankin Bass, who, who had hired me as a uh, story storyboard artist first, and then a, a character designer for Thundercats. And after I went, uh, kind of was kind of easing out of that. Uh, illustrator world, I, I auditioned for them for a series they were doing called the Comic Strip. In the 80s, uh, like 85, 86, where uh, it was going to be made up of four, and it was made up of four, four 10-minute uh, series, and I got hired for two of them, and I did 65 episodes, and wow. it was like, I think it was my first animation audition in New York, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I nailed it, and then I thought, well, that's simple, uh, and then it took me several maybe five, ten years to book the next one. But uh, that was a great experience. And I got to work with Bob McFadden and Earl Hammond, who had been on uh, Thundercats and um, uh, several other actors. Uh, the young Seth Green was on that. He was about ten years old. And uh, Maggie Goodyear and geez, some other really terrific people. And 
we had a hell of a time. It was really fun. Larry Kenny from Thundercats was also a part of one of them. One of the uh, episodes, or one of the uh, mini series, I guess, in this little cluster of shows was called uh, Tiger Sharks, which was essentially Thundercats underwater. And so we had a lot of the same <laughs> cast members playing different roles. And uh, it was cool. Fantastic. Now, a few roles that come to mind for me was, and we've mentioned about this a little bit, was Legend of Korra, where you played Batar Senior in the final season of the series. But you also played right. in Avatar The Last Airbender as Avatar, and I apologize if I mispronounced this name, Avatar Kuruk, I think is how it's pronounced. Sounds, sounds good to me. Yeah, and, <laughs> and various other characters as well. What was it like stepping into the world of, of Avatar? Oh, it was great. I worked with the great Andrea Romano, who's a wonderful animation director, very, very fast and very confident, wonderful woman. And, um, you know, when you when you go in to read one of these things, it's just words on a page, you know, and, and you, you're you looking at it, you don't really see the world, you, you can kind of extrapolate what it might be, but until you see that terrific animation, you really don't know what, what what's happening. Uh, and animation, as you may know, uh, uh, the vo vocal recording is very early in the process so that they can match the drawings up to that timing to, to tell the story. So uh, it's many months or even sometimes in some cases years before you see that final thing. And uh, I didn't see, it was months and months before I saw anything from Legend of Korra. Mm. And I was flabbergasted. I was like, oh my God, this is a really, this is a gorgeous show. And I was so happy to be involved with it. It was absolutely fantastic. It was it was definitely an amazing series. Now, as we all know, that there is going to be the live action Avatar TV series that Mike and Brian are personally working on for Netflix. But they've also announced wow. plans for future Avatar animated series. Have they approached you in making an appearance in the live action series? And would you be interested in coming back into the world of Avatar? I would absolutely be interested in coming back for sure. I, I, I would suspect that they will be wanting to hire people with more of an Asian heritage than I possess, but uh, who, who knows? And I know there are a lot of strange creatures as well, but uh, I would be honored to be part of it. I haven't been approached by anybody about it. Right, because I, I do remember for a fact they actually did confirm they uh, approached uh, Dante Basco, who played Prince Zuko in the series, about making an appearance on the show, and I think even the voice yeah. actress of Toph to make an appearance as well. So, but as far as yeah. I know, that's still kind of in development at the moment. But I am I'm excited for the fact that they're planning on doing more animated series within the world of Avatar, and what I'd really love to see them do is like a, a series on Avatar Kuruk, because I felt like he was a very interesting character, just reading about his story and everything, because I feel like we've only touched the basis with the Avatar series. There's just so much mythology that's left to be explored. So I, Yeah, well, I, I hope to be involved in it somehow by hook or by Kuruk. Absolutely. Now, you also played uh, the genie in various Disney productions, particularly within yes. Kingdom Hearts. What was it like playing a character as iconic as the genie? Well, I mean, gosh, you know, it's a great honor. For me, it was... Uh... Now, I've been playing the genie for quite a while, so it's easy to slip into Robin's voice. So the great Robin Williams uh, was, of course, the originator of genie, and then uh, the great Dan Castellaneta uh, did that uh, for the series... And then afterwards, there were still plenty of uses uh, in the merchandising realm for the Blue Genie. But um, Robin had to approve, uh, I was told, of, of the person that would be playing him, uh, or, or playing the character that he originated. And he's, they sort of loosened the reins a bit, because um, Dan Castellaneta was, I was told this by the people at Disney Character Voices, that he was discouraged from sounding like Robin, uh, but to just sort of evoke the spirit of the genie and to do a lot of different voices and stuff like that. But in, uh, when it came time to replace Dan, or when Dan didn't want to do it anymore, was too busy <laughs> with his, his terrific career, then uh, Robin sort of eased off and said, no, I guess it's okay to, to sound a little bit more like Robin Williams, to have this kind of round, sort of warm, sort of what I consider a Juilliard tone. And so that was when I auditioned, and he uh, apparently approved of, uh, my audition and I got the, the role this is oh man it must be almost a 10 or 12 years ago 
And uh, so I've, I've stepped in and, and done that character as best I could for video games and parades and toys and, you know, odd little things here and there. Uh, and it's, it's always an honor. You know, it's, uh, we try to cleave very closely to what Robin did by listening to the Aladdin soundtrack. We play it back during the sessions and we try to match things very well. And uh, I don't flatter myself that I come any closer than about 75% most of the time, but uh, it's nice to keep that alive and to, you know, just sort of keep flowing the beautiful character, excuse me, oh goodness, Bill's a St. Mary, uh, that <laughs> sort of flowing that beautiful character and that attitude outward and uh, allow other people to experience it in different different venues i think that's definitely fantastic and that's that actually reminds me so much of um this interview that i did with um richard epcar who was the voice who played the the yeah i know richard epcar he's a great guy he's he's directed me in some video games he's absolutely fantastic where he did uh, the voice of the joker for the injustice game series and he actually said to me when uh, we were speaking about mark hamill a little bit because of him of how iconic his Joker was. And he said to me, I had never listened to Mark Hamill's version of the Joker, and I don't want to, because I would just in, invent, I would just end up copying him. Yeah. So it's so I, it's definitely true in that fact, especially when you're having to take on a character that has such legacy behind it, is like, yeah, you you pay you pay you pay respect and spirit to the to the spirit of the original voice, but you also try to go off and do your own thing as well. Because they they wouldn't want you to copy like what you've done like necessarily in the past, you know. Like it's like you still got the blueprint for that original character, but you're also putting your own stamp on it as well. Which I is... suppose so. With the with the blue genie though, I'm 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 not really doing too much of, that I come up with. But every now and then I go, hey, would it be all right if I kind of twisted it this way? And you know, particularly when it would shift into what well, will be fun to have the genie change character like he did in the original. And I don't, you know, I don't have that movie memorized. I I remember, (laughs) I remember what I remember of it, but, uh, you know, I do, I do contribute and, and, and pitch things and they'll say, yeah, that's okay. Or yeah, that'll be great. You know, Ben Hoppy at Disney character voices usually, um, we're, we're very, uh, fond collaborators, co-collaborators. Fantastic. Now, you, you've also stepped into various other projects, like uh, obviously mentioning about Thundercats, but also yeah. Kung Fu Panda, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Scooby-Doo as well. What was it like playing yeah. across those those series? Well, it's great. I mean, it's so much fun. It, it, you know, the hardest part of this business is getting the job. And especially these days, there's just a lot of competition. It's just, uh, it's, it's very wearying because there's so many talented voice artists out there and so many guys who have been doing it for decades. Uh, you know, I've been doing it for 35 years. I know people that have been doing it for longer and, uh, and have had tremendous careers. But once you get in the room, ah, it's just a lot of fun, a lot of playing. You know, it's, it's very rarely any kind of effort at all. It's, it's, it's like recess. And I'm sure a lot of the people you've talked to would share that, that sentiment. You know, we have to be professional and everything, but um, it's quite fun to be able to create vocally. And, and one thing that actors find very liberating about it is that you you aren't tethered to your appearance anymore. You mm. can now be a giant fish or a wrinkled up old thousand year old hag or, you know, or a burly Scotsman and you happen to be a tiny man. Uh, so that's very... It's actually very therapeutic to do that. It actually makes you feel good to do it, to be able to occupy other characters and other other beings. So I would say that's I mean, that's the fun part. It's just when you know there's there's various high points in an actor's uh, daily life, and one of them is when your agent calls or emails you and says, "Well, you booked it," and that's a very high point. And then there's the high point of stepping into the room, stepping up to the mic, and your turn comes up. And you start to play that character. That's another high point. Fantastic. And uh, it's so much higher than the point of, oh, here's the check you're going to get. Yeah, that's not really, you don't really care much about that. That's, <laughs> that's like, oh, okay, nice. <laughs> but it's not what you do it for. You do it for the playing, for the creativity, uh, for the camaraderie, and uh, and the fun. 
Absolutely, that's fantastic. Now, you've also played across, like, in films and series in the comic book universe of both Marvel and DC, from, obviously mentioned Constantine, City of Demons, but also from, like, Batman Gotham Knight as Deadshot to Avengers Assemble as Ultron, with having done Superman Red Sun, the animated film, this year. What was it like playing across the comic book universe? Uh, it's very different, you know. It's uh, it, it's a heightened style. It's just like you know when you when you look at a drawing, a comic book drawing, it has a particular language. You know, it's not like the same language as Leonardo. It's not the same language as Mad Magazine. It's its own aesthetic, and I think that reflects. It's reflected by the vocal work that's demanded of you. You know, it's very strident sometimes. Uh, and in the case of Ultron, which you mentioned, which I've played many times uh, for that series and for uh, numerous video games, uh, it's a very compressed and a very inhuman kind of sound. It's very controlled. Its parameters are very narrow. And, you know, he doesn't even grunt. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> laugh. It's just a, a very narrow channel of expression, which is fine you know that's the character you know he's uh basically a, a kind of an inorganic know-it-all and uh so uh i guess it, it it's its own kind of thing um and i noticed too when i watched the other wonderful performers roger craig smith and uh fred tattashore uh guys like that they um they've adopted this you know it's 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 a no holds barred full out over the ramparts kind of performing that uh it suits that genre really really well mm. it's different than something like uh, constantine city of demons which was much more nuanced and noir and and even red sun had a lot of uh, it's a feature so you know that the performance is a little different a little more subtle i had room for subtlety i'll say so you, know, you have to kind of see what am i fitting into here and then the director helps you a lot. The right. director, who, who, who again, with the creator, with the writer, kind of embraces the whole project, has an idea of, well, what are you fitting into here and what will make you fit seamlessly into this world? What style of performance? Right. Fantastic. Right. And now, as now as uh, in the last couple of years, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe had just recently gotten the rights back to the X-Men and Fantastic Four, are there any particular like Marvel or DC characters or stories that you want to see brought into the live action universe? I don't really have much of an opinion about that, really. I'm uh, not a huge comic book aficionado. Um, I'm interested in the stories, but I, I know too that they, the writers these days, they take great liberties and they kind of spring off from that universe and create their own kind of scenarios. And I'm, I'm interested to see what these new writers are going to create with those characters. You know, I, I don't just want to go see a Fantastic Four story because uh, I, I, I've enjoyed it in the past. I want to see what are we going to do with a guy, you know, what are, what are the, some of the things to explore with a guy who can stretch or a guy who could be on fire, you know? <laughs> I think we, we, we've only scratched the surface of those possibilities. Uh, that's definitely true. And I think in the words of um, Kevin Feige, when he, was, uh, when he got asked about the Fantastic Four, I think in his words was like, you know, I'm really excited to get Marvel's first family up to the justice and respect that they deserve. Like, obviously I'm taking a bit of a slight dig at the other Fantastic Four films, but absolutely true because this is is bringing like the very first characters that Stan Lee ever created in the Marvel Universe up to the standard that they truly deserve to be at. So, and I think for myself speaking as a, as a comic book fan, um, definitely Fantastic Four is really, really what I would love to see. I'd even love to see them... I'm really excited to even see them do Justice League Dark as a live-action property as well. Like, really do full-on Constantine, Satana, Swamp Thing, Etrigan, like, in their full-on glory as well. And I, Because I know they're developing a live-action TV series for that. And, mm -hmm. of course, I'm, I think what we all really have been asking for for a long time, Green Lantern. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, that's... Yeah. So I, it's just you said before. There's so many stories to explore out there that it's just, it it's it's crazy. So yeah, yeah and I think you know on the, to your point on the, on the, you know you take a movie like Joker. Uh, Joker took a very you know 
different view, and I think it really did a great job. Uh, it's a different universe entirely, right? But still, it's like it, it took something that had only been sort of really sketched out by, uh, first of all, by the uh, comic book artists, and then later on by television actors, and then a little more deeply by other uh, film actors and characters and uh, characterizations, and and then brought into this, you know, tremendously realistic depiction by one of our great actors, Joaquin Phoenix, and that shows you that well, you know, built on this kind of flimsy skeleton of of the <laughs> of the comic books of the fifties, you could call it that. Um, you can actually build something that has tremendous richness and appeals to audiences far beyond just the comic book or people that, that like to see those kind of movies. I mean, I, I, I wasn't, you know, on fire to go see Joker. I didn't see it in the theater. I finally watched it just about a week ago. Wow. You know, like wow. I, I almost kind of begrudgingly like, you know, I guess I should see this thing. And uh, my <laughs> wife and I were both just, absolutely entranced by it and I, I really really liked it a lot I appreciated it on a lot of different levels and and that's obviously a testament to the writers and the directors and the people that were putting that story up but that you know conceivably could be done with a lot of, of uh, superhero characters in in all those different universes absolutely and I think just in the words like Todd Phillips uh, said when he uh, got interviewed about the Joker post about working on the Joker movie he said you know I think of uh, comic books as like the American Shakespeare like there's always gonna be more than one version of Hamlet there's gonna be more than one version of Romeo and Juliet like it's it's just a matter of interpretation you know and just like right. looking at it's just like one interpretation of that specific character it's it's definitely true you've absolutely hit the nail right on the head with that it's like yeah there are many different versions of Joker over the years we've had a lot of Jokers from the comics we've had it from the animated series from the games and now bringing this new one with Joaquin Phoenix is just another interpretation of that character. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Now, you've also stepped into the, uh, like speaking about, of course, with the video game world, with projects from Baldur's Gate to Call of Duty, and also with Kingdom Hearts as well. What was it like stepping into the video game world? Well, that's, yeah, that's another different language. It's a different procedure. Uh, you, you very rarely work with other actors. Uh, unless it's in a mocap situation, and I've done those too. Call of Duty was a mocap thing. Um, I, that's a little more theatrical. It's kind of fun because you're working with your body and with props and other players. Uh, that was kind of fun. Um, it's a little more, I guess it's a little more of a, of a job for me because, uh, for example, it's not, like I mentioned before, you don't have like a, a thousand page script that you're working at you have your the scripts almost look like a well they are they're a spreadsheet they're um, conceivable things that you might say under certain circumstances with subtle variations or major changes and you know different ways that you can die and uh, <laughs> you know and so it's it, there's no one thread moving through it it's quite uh, dispersed so you don't feel like you're telling a story you feel like you're narrating a jigsaw puzzle a little bit and uh so you know i guess it's it's not as much it's not as much fun for the actor but hey it, it is fun to create within those lines and uh it's a, it's a different sort of challenge mm. uh, absolutely yeah. and now as many fans will know uh, of video games will know for that matter that we've had so many video game films over the last God knows how long that have been mm. ha, that has quite a bit of a curse to it, but with the success of Detective Pikachu and recently Sonic the Hedgehog starting to break that curse, what is one video game project that you've worked on? Would you want to see adapted for live action? Well, that's a very good question. See, the, I, I'm a terrible guest for this this particular topic because I am not a gamer, so. I go in and I do my part, and it's for me it's a voiceover role, and uh, and I never really see <laughs> I never really see the outcome. But I will say that I I worked on a, a game called Epic Mickey, and then it was followed by Epic Mickey Two. And in Epic Mickey, I played a mad scientist who just kind of laughed and wrung his hands and grunted. And in the second one. He had full-on musical numbers, ballads, 
uh, you know, these big songs that he sang. And I, I worked with musicians and, uh, uh, you know, it, it turned out amazing. So I would say if they were going to put that on stage and do a Broadway musical that I could star in, I would like to do that. Fantastic. That would be that would be fantastic <laughs> if they did something like that. Now, now as mentioned about before, you obviously spoke about like the Thundercats show that you've recently worked, that you recently talked about, which is a reboot of the the Thundercats franchise. If you wanted, right. to, if you wanted to do another revival or reboot of one show you've worked on, what would you want that show to be? Oh well, the you know, the Mad Show that I mentioned before. Uh, it, it's, I think it's an evergreen concept. Uh, it's, it's all based on popular culture, and Kevin Shinnick was managing all these different artists, uh, including the, the mad artist Sergio Aragones, who created some stuff for it. And um, it, it was delicious. Uh, they had all different styles. They had puppets. They had uh, you know, 3D animation, uh, traditional kind of cell animation, and... Uh, and I, I think the, the, the gags that can be built around, you know, it was mostly like popular culture and PG rated and, and safer <laughs> content uh, and characters. And it, it was just so much fun. I would, I would go back to work immediately. It, it, would, it would be a blast. I know everybody that worked on it told us the same way about it. It was, it was so funny. And Kevin, Kevin Shinnick, uh, among many other things, he's been writing uh, Star Wars books lately, I think. But he has worked on one of the earlier Spider-Man uh, Broadway efforts, and uh, also wrote for was one of the writers, uh, first writers for Ro Robot Chicken, that franchise, and um, he's super funny, and so <laughs> our scripts <laughs> made me laugh a lot. Sometimes I, I would laugh, and I could. It was like one of those. It's so funny. I can't. I can't get through it. I can't say this line. Uh, and, and you know that's that's pretty delightful. Fantastic! That would be really amazing if they if they had revived uh, the Mad series. That would be fantastic if they did that. It would be fantastic. Fingers yeah, crossed. A, a cheer would go out through the land. <laughs> <laughs> and where do you hope to see yourself with regards to like acting and entertainment in the long run? Well, now I'm very hungry to get back on stage in front of people. You know, where this quarantine is just. Uh, very, you know, hard on people that, that like to do live performing. I, I mean, it's not a huge part of my world, but it is it is one that I have kept going through the years. And, uh, you know, I feel it. I, I, I want to get in front of people again and, and, and do my impressions and uh, do different kind of uh, do different kind of things and hear an audience and see people in front of me. <laughs> it seems like such a basic <laughs> thing. But uh love to do that i'd love to i'm, I'm set to work on a, a tv pilot that actually my sisters uh, wrote and produced my sister ellen kramer is a fantastic comedy writer and producer who worked on friends and is an, an emmy award-winning writer and uh we we started to work on this pilot and i got a small part in it and uh and then everything shut down so I've got that to look forward to, for which I'm growing a prodigious large mustache, and now it's gotten much larger than I ever <laughs> conceived it would go. <laughs> I actually have to trim it. You know, I've never had to trim a mustache in my life. So uh, I'm anxious to get back to that and, uh, and other things that I was lined up to do. Fantastic. Now, across your entire career, what two shows have you worked on would you want to see a crossover between? Crossover between shows. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I don't have any strong desire in that realm. <laughs> right. I, I think personally for me, I think uh, like two shows that come to mind for me that would be epic as a crossover is um, I think definitely Kung Fu Panda and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That would be pretty epic if they did a crossover like with those those two shows. Maybe even Thundercats and and Ninja Turtles. That would be a pretty interesting one, right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. You're right. <laughs> and what is like one character or series that you've ever wanted to play or ever wished that you played? Uh, I've ever wished that I played. Well, 
Let's see. Sorry, I should have thought of this ahead of time. <laughs> um, you know, it's so funny. I, I don't... I, I, as I said, I'm not a big aficionado of uh, animation and, uh, and stories like that. Um, so I... And all day long, I'm getting auditions and opportunities and queries about different things that, uh, hey, can you play this? Can you do this voice? Can you do this? And I, it's almost like I depend on out, external forces to inspire me to be interested in something. <laughs> and then when I'm when I'm on my own, I'm in a total different direction. I, I'm looking at things that interest me on a very personal level, and it's not anything I, that I flatter myself anyone else would ever be interested in. But I... Uh, I, I, like, I tend to listen to that little voice in my mind that uh, suggests things. And uh, for example, I you know I I do the voice of Colonel Sanders for the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, 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 yeah, I guess you call it an empire out here in the United States. I don't know if you have that in Australia or not. You probably got enough uh, chickens of your own. Don't need to <laughs> ship any chickens across the Pacific. But uh, that, that's a character that I do, and so I create. I, they've been nice enough to let me create all kinds of content for my YouTube channel of, of that character talking to other people in history, like Albert Einstein or Marlon Brando or Rod Serling or whoever I come up with. And so my mind kind of goes and I start creating in that direction or, I don't know. I, but I'm, I'm not uh, burning to tell uh, a story that's, I don't know. Nothing comes to mind on that one. I apologize. That's all. That's perfectly all right. But that's fantastic, though. That's really amazing. In the fact that you just come up with like those, uh, like on your YouTube channel, just with scenarios of like um, Colonel Sanders talking with President Lincoln, or in situations like that, like uh, Colonel Sanders talking to President Lincoln up in the Sahara Desert or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. Yeah. I have a big improv background, and so I love having things kind of thrown at me, and I feel very confident in creating stuff out of nothing. And uh, I, I find it's it's often it's even nicer than when you script something. I, I I've done a lot of scripted stuff that I've written for myself too, and at the end of the day, I'm like, you know, I like this improv stuff better. It has a freshness <laughs> and a peculiarity to it that I think just uh, I don't know. It's sort of matchless. Fantastic. Now, now, kind of a two-part question with this one here. What is your view on where the voice acting industry stands within the entertainment industry? And if you could change one thing about the entertainment industry, what would that be? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, obviously, you know, we, we voice actors are in a different uh, echelon. Um, because we're not seen... Uh, we're not really recognized as much, and because we're very diverse and versatile, it's hard to sort of, sort of hard to pin us down a little bit. So, um, although there is a huge, huge fan base for voice actors, of, of which I'm you know, very, very grateful, uh, it's it's not like you know how many fans does Benedict Cumberbatch have? You know, people know him; they they recognize him, even if he's you know uh, crawling around on a mocap floor being a dragon. We know who this guy is. So obviously the, those guys get uh, the attention that is due them because they are investing so much of their body and soul, quite literally, into their performances. And I wouldn't change that. I think that's that's well earned. Um, I guess I would change. I don't know what would I change. Uh, uh, gosh, you know it's a game. I I I I I, I don't. I don't really want to change the game. Here's what I want to do. I want to see. Um, I want to see more. Yes. Okay. Here's here's what I'm thinking. At the end of the day, I, I would like more different uh, stories to be told. You know, because the commercial realm and big studios and uh, marketing experts, they want if if a big movie comes out and it features a squid that speaks with a Spanish accent and has laser beam eyes and it makes $10 trillion, <laughs> then the next movie they want to make is about a squid with a Spanish accent who's got laser beam eyes. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter if we saw that story and if it's now like, okay, we, we did it. They want that again. And, and that makes sense from a fiduciary, you know, financial sort of viewpoint. But it doesn't, it doesn't make sense from a, a creative viewpoint if you think about the infinity of ideas that are really available to one. So uh, I, I guess I would like, it'll never change, 
but I would like to see that change or, or at least for artists to realize, you know, my weird bright idea is far more valuable than the next reboot of even the Fantastic Four. I, I mean, we're all excited about the Fantastic Four. We'd love to see them again. But somebody's going to come along with an idea that nobody thought of. And indeed, the Fantastic Four in their time, in, in, in the comic book time of the 50s or whenever they were launched, 48, 49, who knows, that was a, an amazing, new, fresh, unheard of idea. And those ideas have more potency and, uh, you know, more, more uh, ability to astonish and entertain mm. than something that, okay, we've seen this a hundred times, you know. If I see another Spider-Man reboot, <laughs> I get it. Okay, I got it. <laughs> he can fly through the air. He's got a web. All right. I, 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 I'm not going to go see that, but I will go see something like Jojo Rabbit. Who the hell imagined Jojo Rabbit? <laughs> How did they even get that movie made? We say, yeah, well, one of our characters is going to be Hitler, but he's fantastic, funny Hitler. You're like, really? <laughs> but that was a that was a terrific movie. You have to thank Taika Waititi for that, and you have to thank him yeah. for something like that. <laughs> it's good. Exactly, but he listened. He Taika, he was not in, you know engaged in well, what can I do with Iron Man that will. Okay, fine. He created something out of his own head, or, or well, I guess there was a source on that. There was a book, but still, he recognized there was something really unique there, and that could tell a, a fascinating story that we've never really seen before. Mm. So, I guess that's the thing I would change is is a little bit for and just for artists, because I know the the business people, the studio guys, they're never going to change. That's their job in a way is to is to make it profitable. But for the artists, I'd like the artists to be confident in pursuing something that is just something that they think is cool, irrespective of what may have happened ever before. Mm. That's definitely definitely true on that. It's funny that you mentioned about, of course, with um, with Taika Waititi, of course, like with having to, we've done uh, like Jojo Rabbit, but of course, like when he, of course, had done Thor Ragnarok at the time, he walked into that film going, yeah, I know that like Thor is an established character in the MCU and all that kind of stuff. And like, but I'm going to bring the comedy to it. I'm going to bring something completely fresh to this character that is, in my mind, pretty drab at the moment. So it's it's definitely true on that. But you could also look at it in the factors like, um, uh, going back to the Marvel Universe, for example, like we were just talking about, is them kind of bringing in new characters that we hadn't seen on screen before. In the case of like, um, going back to the DC Universe, like we've not seen... Like Shazam on screen, we'd not seen Aquaman on in the live action movies, or even the Birds of Prey for that matter. So I, I so I definitely see where you're getting at with this one is trying to bring something new, and new to the to the to the drawing board rather than rehash something that's been done over a hundred times before. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's an infinity of ideas. Absolutely. And, uh, when you, I mean, you, you realize this when you talk to any given person. You, you look at a person, you go, oh, that's Uncle Morty. You know, well, I think I know what he's about. He's about having a beer on Friday, and uh, he was in Vietnam, and okay, yeah, I get it. He watches sports. But no, sit down with Uncle Morty for about two or three hours and find out what, he's, what adventures he's had in his life, and it'll, it'll blow your mind. Uh, everybody's like that. Absolutely. And without, and without getting into any spoilers, what's next for Jim Meskimen for the fans to know about? <laughs> well, what is next for Jim Meskimen? I, I, like I said, I've got this pilot that uh, I will be working on just as soon as they uh, blow the whistle. Uh, there's an episode of Glow that I still have to shoot. I have written a screenplay about imp an impressionist, which is a kind of a crime thriller, black comedy. Uh, and that I sort of took the took the pedal off, took my foot off the pedal on that one. But um, I'm going to get that up and uh, find some way to fund that. And then I'm just going to keep cranking on all the uh, all the creative work that I love to do. I've been writing poems, and I, I just believe in a lot of creativity. And I, I I'm lucky enough to have a lot of different channels that I can express myself on. And so you know, check out my Instagram, my YouTube channel. You'll see some, I think, some very surprising and amusing things. Fantastic. That's yeah. absolutely wonderful. And final question, what do you think Jeannie would say if he was in Australia? Well, he's been down there, you know. I mean, uh, you, can't keep the, you can't keep a good Jeannie down. He can travel all over the world. He can travel all over the universe. 
He's been down there to Sydney, to Melbourne, to, to Adelaide. He's been to the. He's been to Hamilton Island. He's been to the Great Barrier Reef. He's been all over the place. He's been to the outback, mate. He's been down to Perth, I imagine, once or twice. And uh, no, I mean, he's. Uh, he can't keep. Uh, like I said, he can't uh, keep the stopper on the bottle long. So uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Fantastic. That's absolutely wonderful. Jim Meskimen, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor. No, you're welcome, son. Thanks so much for your questions. I appreciate it. I hope I was able to bring a little bit of value to your listeners. Absolutely. That is absolutely wonderful. And anything you would like to say to the fans out there in Australia and in the world? Well, my, to the fans, uh, thank you so much for uh, paying to, for noticing me, I guess. And uh, please do follow me on, uh, on YouTube, on my channel. It would be great to converse with you. I always answer all the comments that I get unless they're you know, really kind of mean or something. And even then I sometimes answer them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, create your future. Uh, there's, uh, there's practically no problem that I can think of in life that can't be, uh, can't be surmounted by, by being a little more creative. So try that. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, guys, if you'd like to find out more about Jim Meskimen, you can check out the links which I'll put to in the description once the interview is finally up on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe to Hannah Talk and follow me on both Facebook and Twitter and be sure to comment below as well. Thank you all so much for listening. This is Simon and Jim Meskimen signing off. Bye for now.